you find yourself lost in Irving Land. Last time, Dr. Smith found an alien machine. Since he never got past the maturity level of a two-year-old, our dear doctor looks with his hands, which is usually what gets him into trouble. This time is no exception. He seems to have accidentally built himself a girlfriend. What is it? I don't know. Dr. Smith, maybe you better check it out. I? Yes, of course. I. You are the designated adult, qualified or not. The robot says it's an android, but something about it doesn't compute. Still, it doesn't appear to be dangerous. Uh, we are the Robinsons. I'm Penny. Do you have a name? Can you talk? Yes, I can talk. My name is Verda. Actually, your name is D. Hartford, and we've seen you before on this channel. I was ordered. What do you mean? Who ordered you? Dr. Smith. Indeed, I did not. But how do you know my name? You ordered me from the machine. I am tuned to your psychic frequency. I am yours. Okay, Adamaniacs, you got a good look at her. Just to make it easier, here's a still shot. If you don't recognize Miss Iceland from the Eli Wallach Mr. Freeze episodes, you should, because she was kind of turning blue there, too. And if you're not an Adamaniac, first of all, you big silly, why aren't you? But second, you might recognize Helen of Troy from the Time Tunnel episode, Revenge of the Gods. One of the more interesting things about reviewing these shows that happen more or less concurrent with each other is seeing who was making the circuit of the shows putting in guest appearances. A lot of folks were doing it, often multiple times. We've seen that again and again with Hogan's Heroes, and Miss Hamilton will be back here two more times. And you know what? If an actor or actress can make a living by doing that, more power to them. And by the way, don't worry about Dr. Smith. He'll figure out real quick that having an android servant to carry out his every wish isn't a bad thing. The boys are doing what they do a lot, drilling for deuteronium fuel so they can get off this planet. They're done for today, but they're telling Judy, warn everyone not to come up here. This is why. Have you ever seen anything like that before? Mm. It lives in there? We think so. We haven't seen it, but uh, my guess is that it's nocturnal. We just haven't had a chance to hunt it down. And as long as it doesn't bother us, we're not going to bother it. Then why was John just talking about hunting it down? They'll put up some signs, too, just to be safe. I was manufactured by Unit 12, RDS Remote Unit. What does that mean? I don't know. What civilization invented you? The Andromedan. And for what purpose? To serve my master, the one who ordered me. Dr. Smith? Yes. May I be excused now? I promised to prepare a foot bath for Dr. Smith. Yes. I told you it wouldn't take long. Now here's the thing. What everybody is describing is a vending machine. Those generally require currency of some kind. She keeps saying Smith ordered her. John is concerned about that. But for now, she's great with the kids and everybody seems to like her. And Smith thinks he's in heaven. Mm -hmm. oh, you've made it too cold. Oh, that is easily adjusted. My left hand functions as a heating element. My right hand is a freezing coil. But since she was only just built, she might need some time to figure out her systems. <laughs> mm. That's lovely. That's lovely. Ah! Stop it at once, you ridiculous Peter! You're scolding me! Ah! She may also need some time to get the hang of multitasking. What is that object? It's a flower, you silly thing. Now you can remove your hand. It's quite cool enough. A flower? We have no such object on our planet. Will you kindly remove your freezing element? I'm not an Eskimo, you know. It has great beauty of structure. I order you to stop this at once, you hear? No! Verda stood up, poked Dr. Smith, said, Tag, you're it, then took his wallet and ran away giggling. And so, financed by Queen Isabella of Spain, Columbus set sail across the uncharted ocean and in the year 1492, landed on a small island, and thereby America was discovered. Discovered by Europeans, you mean. The folks who lived there already knew it existed. Yes? At last I've caught you in an error, you pedagogical pipsqueak. 
You finally slipped a cog, have you? America was discovered in 1493, not 1492. He cannot be serious, but he is. The robot says, a wager. If you're right, you can rewire me with the correct information. If I'm right, you sit down in the class and shut up. Somewhere along the way, they learn that Verda is programmed with all the history of the universe, including Earth, so she'll be the final authority. When did Christopher Columbus discover America? 1492. Would you repeat that? October 12th, 1492. Perfidious creature. You forget who brought you here? I am programmed to serve you. I am not programmed to lie. Dr. Smith will keep his end of the wager. He sits down and promptly starts falling asleep. Verda is examining the robot. You are equipped with model 56 Turon computer, are you not? My computer is the best on Earth. Analog and digital. That's too bad. But at least you're programmed for intergalactic history, are you not? Well, no, but... Andromedian geometry, the calculus of Orion, the anti-gravity theory of Gemus. I can lift very heavy things. She says, wouldn't it be better for them to have a teacher who can tell them about the whole universe and not just Earth? We shall begin by the exploration of the universe. The first creature to leave his home and explore the uncharted skies. An adventure that parallels the voyage of your Columbus. But instead of ocean, he was faced with this. And she isn't just reciting facts like the robot was. She's spinning a story. The kids are entranced. What's she doing? She's teaching them the history of the universe. Oh, yes. Don't you think they should learn about the Earth first? No, Judy, I think perhaps she's right. The Earth is a small place and very far away. This is the world in which the children are growing up. Perhaps they should learn about this place first. Considering last episode you all got put on trial for stumbling around with no clue what you were doing, yeah, it might be a good idea to sit in on a few classes yourself. She embarrassed me. She took my pointer. Indeed she did. For once, my bosom companion, I find that we can agree on something. I can hardly wait until we have enough fuel to take off from here and leave that mechanized maidservant behind. My computers indicate the probability that they will refuse to leave her behind. They wouldn't. They might. They would. They'd be more likely to take her and leave you behind. So there's only one solution. Scare her into believing she's found herself in a horrible place and wanting to go back to wherever she came from. She really digs flowers, so he pulls some up and starts making a trail of them right to the cave where the critter that made those tracks lives. The next day, when she takes the kids on a nature hike, he'll recommend they go that way to find some really neat plants. A classic approach to the problem, if I do say so myself. She will see this lovely flower, and knowing that the children are not permitted into the cave. Danger! 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 The robot went back to the Jupiter 2 and reported that the monster had a hearty meal. Danger! Danger! Did you kill him? The creature might return at any minute. Then again, it's not crazy about meals that bite back. If you can walk, I suggest we do so. The creature might return at any minute. Of course I can walk. You pushed me. You have your definition of walking, I have mine. How does it look? Fine, just fine. It is unwise to alter my specifications. Oh, we're not altering your specifications. We're just dressing them up a little. Will my master be appreciative? Your master? Dr. Smith. Oh, I'm not sure he'll ever be appreciative of anyone. But I think he looks nice. When she isn't serving Dr. Smith, she's a doll for Penny and Judy to play with. Look nice. Haven't you ever seen yourself? The appearance is not important. It is the programming which counts. Couldn't have said it better myself. This is a mirror. You can see the reflection of yourself in it. That way you know how you look. That is my exterior. <laughs> that's a nice way of putting it. Yes, that's how you look. Yes, according to some, perfecting the exterior is the highest goal to which the female of the species may aspire. 
Thing is, she looks exactly the same. You know, she doesn't look any different at all to me. Well, we tried, Mother. I'm glad it's not just me. Dr. Smith takes Verda aside and starts explaining to her what a horrible, hostile place she's come to, and she's not equipped to handle it, so she should go back to the shop or whatever. What are you doing? I'm designing an incredible new hydraulic system whereby pure water can be extracted from solid rock. But you needn't concern yourself with that. I wish to discuss your future with you. My future? Yes. She doesn't seem too worried when he starts talking about the ferocious beasts she'll undoubtedly run into when she takes the kids on their nature walk in the morning. How strong is she? What's she made of? If she's got a heating unit in one hand and a freezing unit in the other, what else has she got tucked away under that Jiffy Pop bag? I have a feeling she might be able to take care of herself. You uh, are programmed to feel fear, are you not? I have a self-preservation circuit if that's what you mean. The question is what she's programmed to do with it and how, and what other factors can override it. I have the solution for your water problem, Dr. Smith. You do. It's not her fault you put the faucet right over your foot. it again, madam. <laughs> While she scrambles a few circuits trying to figure him out, Dr. Smith has been examining the machine again. I've just realized that this is a galactic mail order machine. By pressing the proper combination of buttons, I can have anything I want in the universe. Without payment? I'll think about that later. He may have been a spy for another country, but Dr. Smith is all American. But since he's buying stuff on credit, he can buy enough deuteronium to get them back into space. For the nonce, I shall contemplate a new wardrobe. Sartorial elegance has always been one of my strong points. Or he can do that. Oh, beautiful. Oh, we don't see anything, Miss Verda. I forget your eyes do not have the power to magnify. I have a feeling that critter in the cave isn't going to be much of a challenge for her. What is your face doing? He's laughing. She waves her hand and the flower is microscopic again. She's a little distracted from the lesson plan right now. Do all humans laugh? At one time or another. Why do they laugh? Because they think something's funny. Or for no reason at all. Just because they're happy. Happy? You mean you don't know what that means? No. It's the way you feel inside when you like yourself and the world around you, or when you're with someone you like very much, then I am happy. Now for one of my favorite questions of all time. Which muscles do you move in order to laugh? Well, I can't speak for everybody, but in my house, if you do it right, all of them. Pull, Nini, pull! Put your back into it! It is impossible. The hat cannot be removed. <laughs> Will well, you stop that laughing this instant? Will you stop laughing? Verda won't. She's just getting the hang of it. You, madam, can you operate this machine? No. Can you tell me how to get my clothes back? I know nothing of the machine. They're off to continue their hike. I need you to help me work this machine. I cannot and I will not spend the rest of my existence clad in this ridiculous rigmarole. Let's see. Who ordered it? Who put it on? Oh, right. The robot did all that, yes? He might be able to pull off the Cyrano look, but I doubt he can sword fight or compose poetry, much less do both at the same time. Better find a way to return that outfit. At least his plan regarding Verda is working. The fact that he's put the children in mortal danger, too, is an unfortunate side effect. <laughs> They'll run, all right, straight to the drill site where John and Don have their laser rifles handy. That's either one super-powered laser or one super-wussy monster. Are you all right? Yes. I thought the monster had us for sure. 
But she put herself in front of him and drew his attention. She can't understand why she did that. It's not part of her programming. But we've already figured out that she's like Robin Williams' Bicentennial Man. Something's glitched in her programming and made her a lot more human than she's supposed to be. Back at the machine, the fifth musketeer is still trying to figure out how to change his clothes. That's supposed to come off like that. You use it to dust the machine. Well, have you found anything yet, you defective detective? Or am I to remain in this molting costume forever? From scanning known components, a sequestrial theory emerges. If two buttons provide merchandise, perhaps by pressing three buttons at the same time, merchandise may be removed. It might be worth a try. Obviously, I have nothing to lose. Remember, he said that. Your complaint has been received. Stand by. Stand by. Approaching. Unlike the average department store, with this company, the complaint department comes to you. 4,823rd level, 3 millionth galaxy. The gentleman on the left was named Fritz Feld. We saw him twice in Batman, so we may recall one of the things he's known for. Shh, I know, I know. Use the code. It gets better results. And who knew Tiger Joe Marsh could do it that well, too? Last time we saw him, he was torturing people in a dungeon in Jericho when the Time Tunnel Boys showed up. His experience with them was so traumatic he gave up torturing and everything else and became the original model for Mr. Clean. Sundish is the name. Sundish. What an odd name. <laughs> <clears throat> Complaint manager for the Celestial Department Stores, Area 17. Get to know Mr. Zumdish. He'll be back two more times. He may well be the most memorable character they met in all their travels. Is that the material in question? Well, I see nothing wrong with it. You made a wise choice, if I must say so myself. The fit is perfect. The uh, eternal fabric will last forever. That's nice, but he can't take it off. How's he supposed to poop? We stand behind our merchandise 100%, sir. If you're displeased, I am. I would prefer to have my own clothes back, please. Very well. Either that or transfer into Paris around the time of the French Revolution. This is one of the older vending machines. Definitely outmoded, but it should do the trick. <laughs> He says, I also have a complaint about the Verda android I ordered. Zundish says, I know that model very well. As a matter of fact, when the credit department heard I was coming here, they asked me to bring the bill along. Remember how you said you'd worry about payment later? It's later. Ordinarily, this model sells for 100 salastros, but this week only she has been reduced to 89.95. Now, if you prefer, you can pay one third down and the rest in. I do not propose to pay for her at all. Zumdish says she's a custom model, so she can't be returned. You have to pay. I have no intention of paying you one red cent, or whatever your currency happens to be. That is very unfortunate, sir. Very unfortunate indeed. Tiger Joe thinks you should pay. Zumdish says, you're under arrest. Mr. Zumdish, I leave it to you. She's definitely defective, you see. I ordered her to my specifications, and then she deserted me for the children. She took my pointer. She took his pointer. Okay, a defective model is a different matter. Zumdish examines her and says, you're right, she's defective. We'll take her back, dismantle her, and use the parts for other things. No, you can't take her. I won't let you. Penny, go to your cabin. Oh, please don't let them take her. Please. Penny. Go ahead, dear. There's no use prolonging this. I take a nap. No, you leave her here. We'll talk this over and let you know what we decide to do. Zumdish isn't used to other people making the rules. You are in no position to dictate any terms. With one wave of my hand, I can have the ship disintegrated. Uh-huh. That's a really stupid way to handle non-paying customers. You might, but uh, we're still going to discuss it. 
Stay away. I give you five minutes, not one second more. At the end of that time, you will deliver the android to me or be destroyed. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody in the galaxy runs around bellowing, I will destroy you, destroy, destroy, destroy. We've heard it all before. Shut up and go wait. That's better. What are you going to do? I don't know. I honestly don't know. There's a statement you never thought you'd hear come out of his mouth. As I see it, we don't have any choice. After all, they do own her, and we don't have the money they require for her purchase. Let them take her back. I know we don't have the money, but, well, maybe we could trade something for her. Well, it's a possibility. You have something in mind? Well, deuteronium's a universal currency, I think. I mean, everybody uses it. They're one canister short of enough deuteronium to blast off. If they trade it to Zundish, they may be stuck here for life. The family says, we can live with that possibility. Have you all taken leave of your senses? Shall we be deprived of the one thing which has kept us alive just for the sake of a machine? That's all she is, you know, just a machine, not a human being. I'm not so sure about that. Look. Smith asked her if she's programmed to feel fear. I'd call that a yes. And this goes way beyond self-preservation programming. Why don't we take a vote? All those in favor of trading our fuel for Verna raise their hands. Ah! Okay, let's go present our offer to Mr. Zumdish. We've decided to keep her. Now, we don't have any money, but uh, maybe we could affect the trade. A trade for inferior merchandise like that? Like her as she is. Very well. What did you have in mind? Petronium. You do use it on your planet, don't you? We have his attention. John says, a canister of deuteronium for Verda. Your refining methods are very crude. This would have to be refined 100 times before we can even use it. All right. Two canisters. We have his undivided attention, and we have a deal. John, Penny and Verda are gone. Gone? Yes, they must have gone out the escape hatch. Penny was so afraid that they'd take Verda away. Are you trying to trick me? No tricks. If we don't find them before dark, I don't know what'll happen to them. If they were trying a trick, would they tell you about it up front? John and Maureen go off to look for them. Zundish says, my security guard is designed to track these androids so he can look too. You must not attack them. I won't let them take you. He's only programmed to do harm if he's attacked, so that was a bad idea. And that huffing and wheezing he was doing? Yeah, they had a little excitement on set about that. Bill Mummy said in an interview that Tiger Joe had been running a lot and he had an asthma attack. He was kind of in the middle of it in that clip we just watched. When the director yelled, cut, Tiger Joe collapsed to the floor. After treatment, he was all right, but it got pretty scary for a while. Can't you do something? My prime directive as a machine is not programmed for aggressive action. But you're not just a machine, you're not. Stay here. Where are you going? Stay here, I'm going to try. Stop. That was fortuitous. A better way to deal with the security guard would have been to make like you're surrendering, then go up and pat him on the cheek with your right hand. Once his brain is frozen, you can get away. You were programmed never to attack a security guard. I do many things now I was never programmed for. And you're not going to take their fuel from me, do you hear? You will take me back with you. I don't want to stay any longer. Zumdish is baffled. This model was never intended to do all this stuff, so he needs to study her and try to duplicate her. Then you're not going to take her to the scrap heap? Oh my goodness, no. She's close to human now with qualities that are much in demand in this universe. She was willing to sacrifice herself in the name of love, and that's a rare thing indeed. Berta, do you want to go with him? I'd love to be able to stay with you, but you're going to be leaving soon anyway. And there are many places where I'm needed more. So much for that. He can take his security guard, Verda, his machine, and whatever that thing was that he arrived in, and mosey on his way. It's the first time I've ever lost one of my machines. It was Smith again. I'll bet money on it. 
Well, don't worry, Mr. Sumdish. We'll get your machine back for you. Oh, I'm not worried about getting it back. It's just that I have never had one stolen before. Or not. Don is correct. You must take it back. It does not belong to you. Never fear. Smith is here. I'm only borrowing it. And Mr. Zumdish should be delighted. I intend to make him a very rich man. How? By ordering some more verders, of course. Training them as I did the first one. Giving them polish, so to speak. I'm sure his influence is what made Verda into whatever she is now. He's seeing tenfold profits before he's even talked to Mr. Zumdish. As he said, he's only borrowing the machine, so neither it nor anything it makes belong to him. The fortune he's seeing will go into Zumdish's pocket, not his. He's not very good at thinking these things through. Look, it's Dr. Smith. Is he all right? Yes, indeed. You have but to push any of the buttons to free him. If you want to keep him, I would suggest that you do it right away. There's always a chance that he might be ordered from a different planet where I have a machine like this. In particular, he didn't consider the possibility that Mr. Zumdish can do that. If you would care to leave Dr. Smith in the machine, I think I can get you a fair price for it. From whom and what would they think he's good for? You know, for two cents, I'd take Zumdish's advice. But then again, I'd never have the pleasure of watching you try to get out of work again, would I, Doctor? Oh, well. He pushes a button and Dr. Smith appears in a glass tube like Verda did. He seems to be unconscious. Hello. I must have dozed off for a moment. I had the strangest dream. They'll roll dice later to decide who gets to tell him and see the look on his face. For the cliffhanger, Dr. Smith is building a remote weather station. Our operation is a smashing success. The operation is a success, but unfortunately, the patient is dead. Nonsense, Ninny. This weather station is completely operational. You failed to secure the wires of the sensitizer. Maybe you'd better check the wiring again, Dr. Smith, just in case. Nonsense, my boy. It's an absolutely perfect order. Someday, Will is going to insist on listening to the robot and we'll have a really boring episode. Ah, Professor. Finished. A push of the switch is all that is necessary. Very good. And then you shall have the honor of connecting the relay station to Jupiter 2. Splendid. Observe. <laughs> Obviously. A faulty relay. Or maybe it was what the robot said in the first place. We won't have time to ponder that. The robot warns that an alien is approaching. He's a veritable giant. Ask him if his name is Andre. I'll offer him my hand. That's a universally understood gesture. Oh, it's an excellent idea. Friend. Yes, I'm a friend too. The gesture may not be as universal as you think it is. Looks like on his world it's an invitation to wrestle. Hey, no fair. Nobody told him this was a tag team match. And besides, they didn't tag. As I said, both Verda and Zundish will be back. The vending machine won't, which raises a few questions. That machine was overgrown with vines and bushes, so it's been there for a while. They've been taking that same path to the drill site for days on end, and nobody noticed it before. Why? When was it put there? And now that they let Dr. Smith out of it, what happens to it? Can they still use it? Did he take it back once Smith was released? We don't get answers to any of these questions. Things like disappear, don't disappear that we know of, but they're never seen or heard from again and never mentioned again. Virtually nothing that happens to them really changes them as people or has any noticeable effect on their lives. Stuff just happens and then it's gone. The derelict ship in the first season was a good example. Once they escaped the ship, none of that was mentioned again until a clip show in the next season, Whereupon then we got our questions answered. Do we have to wait until next season for answers to our current questions? Or will we ever get answers? 
Don't misunderstand me. I'm loving this show. But if you're after continuity and character growth, you came for the wrong series. Here, we bring in some space peril wrapped up in silliness, deal with it, then sit back with a cup of coffee and a donut and wait for the next one. I'll see you next time you find yourself lost in Irvingland. She took my pointer.